is my third talk. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, not really on how I do it for carotid and arthrectomy, but really about how do we select patients currently uh, for CEA versus carotid artery stenting. Um, I, as some introduction, obviously, carotid stenosis is important because of the evidence of the strokes itself. And um, for, the, for the novice, really be aware of how we look at the degree of stenosis based on whether it's the NASET criteria and whether it's ECSD criteria and look at that how uh, usually we look at the NASA criteria about more than 70% being uh, symptomatic, but that will correspond to ECSD of 85%. Um, how do we then define symptomatic versus asymptomatic? So symptomatic really is the de development of neurologic symptoms. There are sudden and onset referral to the IC territories, TIAs, uh, MROSIS fugex, or transient monoocular blindness within the last six months, and it should exclude vertigo or syncope. So a lot of, we start off by just looking at evidence and the evidence is really based on the 2021 uh, guidelines for strokes prevention in HA or ASA. And uh, just be, for the group itself, uh, be familiar what it means by the level of evidence in ABC versus the class of recommendations. Excuse me. So this is based on the evidence. This is really uh, the actual entire um, strategy. So number one is whether they are asymptomatic or they are symptomatic. And then they go look at the diff, uh, degree of stenosis itself. Let me just move to the easiest category. So if you're symptomatic in the last six months and you have carotid stenosis of more than 70 to 99%, you should be at CEA plus best medical therapy at class one's evidence. For CAS, excuse me, carotid artery stenting, uh, it should be considered if you are high risk for uh, CEA at class 2A uh, and B evidence itself, all right? You know, if you are at moderate stenosis of 50 to 69%, you are at CEA plus BMT at 2A, B uh, recommendation. And that's where uh, for CAS, we will be at class 2B. Uh, I've already talked just now a little bit about the occlusion. So if you're in occluded carotid, you should be at best medical therapy and not consider carotid revascularization. If you are asymptomatic and you have obviously less than 60%, there's no need to do anything. The, if you are at 60 to 90%, you then have to restratify whether it's more than five years favorable anatomy, and then you will be considered CA and CAS. But I must say most of the time in my unit itself, if you're asymptomatic, the default really is at BMT. Um, you are going to wait for two more trials to come in, which is the CREST-2 trial and the ECST-2 trial, uh, whether, where if you're asymptomatic, uh, whether you'll be better at BMT. At the, uh, if I'm not wrong, the latest stroke interim results, the ECST2 has announced that um, the best medical therapy trumps comparing to CAS or CMT. Uh, Crest, the other consideration here, which is not because um, is whether it will improve cognitive outcomes. And that's really still unanswered. There's questions about you may be asymptomatic, but by clear, if you have a degree at 60% and 99%, although you are technically asymptomatic from an infarct point of view, whether by clearing and doing the stenting or CEA, you would then have a better cognitive outcome is something that we don't know. And that we have to wait for Christ each outcome. So just this is really based on the statistics. So uh, then the other things that is uh, going to differentiate between uh, CEA and CAS is age is interesting a factor. If you're above 70, should consider CEA. Uh, and that's really because in the periprocedural, uh, you can see the CAS events are actually higher. But if you go beyond that, then actually uh, CEA is, uh, um, is almost equivalent, although it still shows a little bit, especially in that 70 group. Okay, the other one is if you are talking about revascularization within a week of the index stroke, then you can consider CEA. If you're talking about trying to do it within two weeks, uh, to uh, the other important of this guideline is that you should do any of this carotid revascularization within two weeks in order, especially for the 70 to 99% stenosis for the outcome, for better outcome. 
Um, interestingly, the other one that you need to, while we are talking about CEA, CAS, uh, be aware of the new kit on the block, which is the T car, and that's going to come in. At the moment, because of the lack of uh, literature, we don't know what is the outcome. But um, the currently what we hear is that the complication rates from infarcts and all that is much lower because of the it avoids the excess. And what what are we talking about? What is what is Tika? Really, it avoids the arch problems. And then because there's flow reversal, so it reduces the uh, the ischemic infarcts or the embolic infarcts itself. And they're waiting for this literature to be pre uh, presented. So uh, watch out for Tika while we are talking about CEA and CAS. Now, uh, that's really the literature, but you don't really only talk about it at the 70% stenosis. You, uh, you have to consider many other factors about it. So how do I choose? So for example, if you have accessible, you have no ipsilateral carotid, you have a history of renal impairment, you can't have contrast or contrast allergies, your risk of stroke, you should be considered CEA. And that's really what you do, right? The carotid bifurcation, arthrotomy, and atrectomy itself, and then consider a patch. In fact, I think the, the patch itself now, most people will do routine patching uh, because of the uh, it has proven to have decreased uh, restenosis risk. This is carotid artery stenting, where you really bypass it with the carotid plug with the wire, then you deploy the stent. Sometimes you may need to do angioplasty, where it's where you, have, uh, you will have carotid plug flying up. You would have then all this uh, protection device to catch all the embolic uh, material that's coming. Be aware the CAS is heterogeneous. It's not one, um, really you need to be aware of the various devices and they are already talking about whether it's open cell, closed cell, whether it's closed and how malleable it is. And, um, and there's so many vendors down the road itself, right? The, the what we I showed you just now is really just seventy percent, ninety nine percent. But this just looking at the stenosis. But the 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 thinking has evolved a lot more in terms of looking at the plug morphology, whether it's lipid laden, is it calcified, and how do you classify that that group itself? And more and more, uh, the literature then look at perhaps using the the the. The plug morphology itself may also be important in order for you to decide between CAS and CAA. So if you're saying CAA itself, long lesions are appropriate for CAA. If you have soft lipid plugs, because once you do the angioplasty or the stenting, this will embolize. And so if it's this, it's better to choose CAA itself, or you know that there's circumferential heavy classification. That itself then would uh, preclude you from the stent opening and so that's the problem. Um, then the other category is the excess, right? It depends on what is sort of an excess that is available of uh, the patient presents to us, right? So if this is if you're going to come in from the groin and this is the kind of anatomy that you have, and this is fairly common because you are always dealing with patients with atherosclerotic disease, then uh, choose uh, CA from that point of view, looking at the anatomy of the ICA itself, and then look at the arch anatomy. And that's the reason why TCA might be useful because of the excess. Um, what are the other things? So you have significant ICA toxicity. If you have intraluminous thrombus, that's probably good for CA, or you have embolic phenomenon itself. But what about CAS, right? Uh, CA is definitely, you know, Kate was just saying that there's many ways of doing things. But what are the cases that you will choose for CAS if your patients have very, very high bifurcation or carotid? There's already intracranial extension involving the cavernous sinus. You have previous stenosis uh, or previous CA itself, tendon stenosis. And, and more commonly, sometimes post radiation, you have complete contralateral stenosis or occlusion, right? Uh, and really, you have to look at where the bifurcation is and whether it's easy, easy accessible. The kind of pseudo aneurysms that this most likely is suitable for CAS. You have contralateral ICA occlusion, uh, much better to do stenting in terms of the ischemic time. Uh, CAS itself, if you have a problem of a, radi a nerve palsy, previous neck dissection, radiation, arthritis, takayasu, that's also suitable for CAS itself. Because look at this, right? If you're post-radiation, that's the skin you're going to go through. That's going to be hostile. Your wound will not heal. Everything is secretized or going to be all scarred down and you're going to have a problem, right? If you have going to, you, one problem, and we have to be realistic as surgeons that you're going to injure some nerves sometimes uh, along the career. And if the patient already have the problem of vocal cord palsy and from the contralateral side, it's better to avoid that. 
For CAS, look at the cardiac factors because really it's slightly more uh, minimally invasive from that point of view. Uh, technical aspects, what do we do? Well, we do it routinely with new, uh, neural monitoring and uh, we tend to do the oximetry plus the SSEP, MEP. Uh, we, don't have, we don't do the TEG, TCD and ECG uh, for EEG uh, intraoperatively. Uh, that's really very standard in terms of what you do. The kind of incision that you can have, I tend to just do the simple linear incision. We will have the intramotor. This is the cerebral oximetry. Sometimes uh, you will also have anesthetists love to use this BIS monitoring as well at this moment. Um, when you start doing, it's important to identify the structures, look at, confirm that this is the ECA by looking at the superior thyroid artery, look at uh, all the important nerve, the 12th nerve, the uh, and the, the muscles which you can open up for the for um to uh, to reach higher bifurcation itself and having good vessel loops around the wing. Uh, so the 12th nerve, right? The and then the answer, and the answer usually we can go through avoid injuring the mm -hmm. the uh the vagus nerve and and also do less uh, dissection around here because you want to keep the carotid innervation. Uh, sometimes we will ligate the facial vein and this is really the whole anatomy of what it means by the, the facial vein that is coming across. Um, if you're going to start doing patching but, and, and that's going to double the ischemic time for you to do the continuous stitching, uh, then you have to consider uh, using uh, shunt all the time and that's the uh, Prui Inihara shunt uh, that we do and um, unfortunately, it is a little bit not so malleable, and so sometimes it's very stiff, and it does make it a little bit more fiddly in terms of the surgery, um, because you do need to have a bit of time to know which balloon to blow up, uh, and what is the, the the amount of air or the fluid that you need to do, and and be be familiar with it. The risk of dissection of the vessels proximal and distally is obviously there uh, if you're going to do that. So that's where it is. And so sometimes we tend to do just primary closure, but I think the literature is now level one uh, that is you need a patch. Okay. Um, some other perioperative consideration for CA, CAA. Uh, the debate between uh, RA and GA, that's inconclusive. That's very well Cochrane reviewed and really there's no real difference. Monitoring techniques, we look at the stump pressure, the TCDs and osmetry uh, that you have. And really depends on your unit, what is uh, available. Uh, we don't tend to do thumb, thumb pressure anymore. Uh, this is a bit too cumbersome. So we tend to use the Massimo or the Cerebral Osimetry. Uh, MEP, SSBC. A few things that is important while you're manipulating the carotid sinus, be aware of the tachycardia that can happen or the bradycardia that can also happen itself. And sometimes giving the LA may be important. When we do cross clamping, uh, I would turn generally ask for thiopentone, heparin, and a bit of a dexa, and to bring up the blood pressure by about 20%. And after unclumping, uh, communicate with the anesthetist to bring the blood pressure down itself. Intraoperative, uh, for the, if you're talking about uh, stenting itself, also um, to be aware when you're doing the balloon the inflation itself, that can reduce cause sympathetic discharge and, and a parasympathetic flow, causing bradycardia and hypotension. So having atropine around is important. Um, the other important thing is when you have problems of CEA and you have this issue of delayed emergence, uh, most of the problem could be at the carotid thrombosis and the uh, intimal flap itself. So there are two things that uh, we watch for. Number one, especially if you're dealing with very critical stenosis itself, is the risk of post-anatractomy. Sorry. Mm, Post-anatractomy uh, post hyperperfusion, and that can be avoided by good um, control of blood pressure. Um, the other one is the possibility of the intimal flap and that you can have happen causing you to have thrombosis. So remember while you when you finish dissecting this bit here, right? When you do the other to re, like sometimes you really have to stitch that whole bit down in order to prevent the flap dissection up in doing the carotid anatomy. Uh, hematoma is a problem um, for both 
uh, CEA or the groin hematoma, especially if you're on double antiplatelets, even then we also have hemat uh, heparin on board as well. So be aware of this because of the possibility of the air, of the airway compromise. And uh, sometimes you may have to open up the neck emergently. Here is really not the, the outward hematoma that you're worried about. You're worried, what you're really worried about is retroperitoneal hematoma and obviously the vascularity of the femoral vessel. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.